Okay, we come to Articles 11, 12, and 25 here of the Augsburg Confession this morning. And do you all have Bibles already? We aren't going to go through as much in the Bible as we have in some of these previous lessons, but we still will be using them. So, and then of course we have to take a break from the Augsburg Confession next week so we can have breakfast. Um, <coughs> Okay, number one, Dr. Eck in his 404 propositions. Again, the, the 404 propositions were those uh, statements of Dr. Eck that the Augsburg Confession kind of used as a blueprint to write against because they were so filled not just with distortions but sometimes outright lies. And here is one of them. Uh, he accused Lutherans of doing away with private confession and absolution. So if you skim through Article 11 and Article 25, the last few paragraphs, um, and I did not print uh, 11, 12, and 13, and I couldn't squeeze those on the page, but there's nothing in there that isn't in the previous uh, few paragraphs as well in Article 25. What did the Lutherans actually do away with? So, I don't know, itemizing your sins? <laughs> yes, itemizing your sins. Do we have private confession in our church? Yes. Yes. We certainly do. But who instigates it? Is it the clergy telling you, you must come and confess? No. You know, it's when a guilty sinner feels the need to confess, they arrange an appointment with me and then confess their sins. Have you, and if you look in the hymnal, I believe it's page 156 that has the order for private confession. It's right there in our hymnal, if you've never seen it before. Uh, so, so by no means do we do away with private confession. We do do away with the enumeration of sins, saying you've got to list all of your sins. I mean, who really thinks that a person is able to do that? <laughs> I mean, even the unconscious ones that we have, there's no way you could. Right. I have a friend that grew up Catholic, and she mm -hmm. said, when we used to have to go to confession, we made things up. Because you couldn't remember everything you sure. did wrong. So you just made things up as you went along. Yeah. Like I was hitting my brothers and sisters. She says, I didn't hit my brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> Chased them, but didn't, you know. It's important to list some stuff off. Yeah, it, the, the important thing in, in Catholicism, we should say this too, it's not so much that you get all the sins listed, it's that you have enough sins listed so that you do enough satisfaction. So if you can't remember a sin, yeah, by all means make one up. Because that way you'll still have satisfaction prescribed to you. You do the satisfaction, and that'll, that'll take care of the sin you can't remember. Well, we'll it's talk. a sin and of itself if you make one up. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so, so we'll, we'll, when we get to number four, we'll talk more about uh, satisfaction. Uh, number two, uh, table one back there, please. Psalm 19, verse 12, and then table two, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Who can discern his errors, forgive my hidden faults? Who can discern his errors, forgive my hidden faults? And Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? No one can truly examine their heart and correctly label everything that's in the heart, either sin or not sin. And no one can be totally aware of every sin they've committed. We have hidden faults. We, we, don't, we sin sometimes and don't even realize we're sinning. Sometimes we sin and we know perfectly well we're sinning. But there are some times that we sin and don't even know that we're sinning. So to say that we'd have to list all of our sins would, would be an exercise in futility. We'd never get there. Number three, agree or disagree, the problem is not so much sins, but sin itself. It's like you said, it's part of your, I think when you're enumerating your sins, it's like the part of that work righteousness, <clears throat> what you do or what you didn't do, when actually the problem is 
your heart, what you're thinking, and what drove you to, you know, hate for your brother or disrespect, you know, to actually do the act. That's right. Yeah. You know, so, so, so if I'm doing marriage counseling and the the wife is <coughs> upset at the husband because he won't quit smoking, and the husband is upset at the wife because the the way she leaves things around the bathroom and so on. We could spend our whole session dealing mm -hmm. with smoking and how to arrange the bathroom. Mm -hmm. and what would we get done? In the end, nothing. It'd be like trying to treat cancer, cancer with a Band-Aid. You've got to dig down into the actual root of the problem. Now, Gary and Cindy are talking about bathroom organization. Oh, <laughs> 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 we could open that up to a whole discussion. They seem to have a problem with that, too. I'll call on you next week. Do you want to say thank you? There's, a, there's always the old toilet seat thing. <laughs> Oh, there. <laughs> there's separate bathrooms. There's always the old helpful sign if you sprinkle when you tinkle, be a sweet. We aim to please. We aim to please. Okay, now, now so a little, a little deeper then when we go to number four. Catholic teaching is that penance consists of three parts, contrition, confession, and satisfaction. Satisfactions are what the priest commands the repentant person to do. Such satisfactions might include fasts, prayers, forms of self-denial, etc. From Article 25, Paragraphs 4 and 5, and from what we've already learned, what's wrong with demanding satisfactions to contrition and repentance? <clears throat> That isn't going to make the sin go away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, um, and what never gets mentioned, according to paragraph 5 there? The forgiveness. Forgiveness of Christ one. Yeah. Everything Christ did, it, it isn't mentioned at all. Christ's death has to apply to our earthly lives. Christ's death has to apply to our individual sins. It's never applied when you talk about satisfaction. I was trying to, as I'm reading that, I'm trying to remember um, contrition, confession, and satisfaction. There, there's a substitute for contrition in Catholic theology, too. Uh, contrition is just, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry that I am this way. Um, there, there's actually, I think it's attrition. It's when you're really not sorry. You know you've sinned, and you know that God condemns that sin, but you're not sorry about it. But you kind of want to be sorry about it because you want to be forgiven, or you want you want to be able to confess and, and have satisfaction pronounced. So there, there is another category called, I believe it's called attrition, where. You, you wish you were sorry, but you're not. What do you do with that, then? Well, it, it, it doesn't really matter as long as you get around to confessing your sins and having the satisfaction pronounced. And then you do the satisfaction. Maybe there's more satisfaction if you're confessing out of um, attrition rather contrition. I don't know. But as long as you want to be sorry, you don't actually have to be sorry. Because they, they ran, ran into that a lot, where... Uh, if, if someone is, is a habitual drunk and they're alcoholic, perhaps, they're not really sorry and they're going to keep doing it. It's just, you know, give me something now so, so I can know that God's not going to punish me for this, even though I know for sure I'm going to go out and do it because I want to do it. I wish I were sorry, but I'm not. The, the, I, and, you know, if, if you can find something and correct me on that, I'd, that'd be perfectly fine with that. I believe it's attrition. All right, so what's wrong with demanding satisfactions to contrition and repentance? They, they take away from what Christ did. Or they make it somehow to say that Christ didn't do enough. Yeah, sure, Christ died for the sins of the world, but not that one. You've got to do something for that one. Or he started the ball rolling. Maybe that's a better way to put it, to be fair. 
to what they're trying to say. Christ really started the ball rolling when it comes to this whole forgiveness thing, but you've got to push it the final uh, across the goal eventually yourself. Okay, anything else on the first four? Okay, so when the Catholics talk about penance, they are talking about contrition, confession, and satisfaction. Number five, look at Article 2, paragraphs 2 through, I'm sorry, Article 12, paragraphs 2 through 5. What are the actual two parts of repentance? Or penance, if we wanted to say penance, but the words become so loaded we don't really use the word penance anymore. Is one absolution? One is absolution, and the first one is contrition. Contrition, contrition is real, yes. With broken heart and contrite sigh. Contrition is real. <coughs> Contrition and faith, or uh, or absolution. So it is admitting that we are sinful, admitting those sins that especially trouble us, that we're aware of, and receiving the pronouncement of forgiveness. Moving right along, Article number 6, read Article 12, Paragraph 6. First of all, what is the blessing of this godly repentance? Good works. What are they driving at? Oh, I, I think what they're looking for in the first part, good works would be the answer to the second part. I, I, they're a blessing, so it's not wrong to say it. But um, what flows from repentance is faith in Christ and the forgiveness we have in him. That's where the good works come from. And those are going to be actual God-pleasing good works because they flow <clears throat> from hearts that are at peace with God rather than hearts that are disturbed and say, i got to do something or else I'm in trouble. That which is done under compulsion can't actually be a good work if the compulsion is fear. But it clears your conscience. Pardon? Yeah. It clears yeah. your conscience. Yeah, it clears your conscience. The blessing of godly repentance is it completely clears your conscience. Or, um, is that where it, yeah, it, it delivers it from terrors. Your conscience is absolutely clean because whatever sin you've committed you know has been transferred to Jesus and he suffered. He made the satisfaction. It almost sounds like it clears it so now you can start over. Well, in practice that's what's going to happen because we have our sinful natures. But um, I think a better way to look at it is that no matter what we do to ourselves as far as making our Earth, heavenly record full of sin, God always sees us as if we are pure. And the pronouncement of forgiveness isn't just whatever sins you've committed up to that point, those have been wiped away, now, you know, after you sin some more, come back and then we'll wipe those out too. It's that you live in the peace of forgiveness. That's sort of what this little term that Paul uses all throughout his epistles, <coughs> in Christ, means. To be in Christ is to be in this sphere of the loving God who looks at us and sees only Christ's righteousness. The pronouncement of forgiveness, then, is more of a reminder than anything else. Remember, you have been forgiven. Remember, you live in the peace of forgiveness. If you miss church on a Sunday and don't have your forgiveness pronounced on you that Sunday, does that mean the next time you come to church you've got two weeks worth of sins that need to be forgiven? No, that, that's not how it works. You are forgiven. For your past, present, and future sins, you are forgiven. But we need that reminder again and again. I have a question. Yeah. So, 
a Catholic were to be in a car, and right before they die, they say a cuss word mm -hmm. or use God's name, name in vain. They never got a chance to repent of that sin. So they automatically... They that would be know. something to be very concerned about. What are you doing at the moment of death if you're a Catholic? Yes. Because no, there was no satisfaction for that sin. I, and I was never able to confess that sin. Yes. Now, I sure wouldn't want to die while I was committing a sin. But if I do, I still live in Christ. That's why they have confession on Saturday, and then that wipes out all those sins for the week. Now you can not do anything from Saturday at 4 o'clock till Sunday. You can go to communion because your soul is mm -hmm. pure, and or you don't want to go out on Saturday night, maybe and do something bad. So then, then your soul is pure, and then that follows again for the next week, so that you can get right. Forgetting. Right. That, that, that's exactly what you were talking about. Like, yeah, you're, we're filling up our slate, then do the penance, have the satisfaction pronounced, and then, then we've got it clean for now. But then you know, we're going to get it dirtied up again. It's like taking your car to the car wash continually. You know, we, by God's grace, the dirt of our sins just doesn't stick to us. Hey, number seven, read Article 25, paragraphs 2 through 4. Why is absolution to be so highly prized, and why is it such a privilege for us to use absolution? This is what God says. And if God says it, this is what God wants. He wants his people to live in the joy and peace of forgiveness. He wants his people to do good works, but good works can only come from hearts that are free. And so he wants his people to be declared forgiven again and again, so that they are reminded that they're able to do whatever it is God sets in front of them to do with clear consciences. And they, they, there are, the, Melanchthon has plenty of digs in the last, or the last seven articles right, uh, on how the practice in church was before the Reformation. There was profound silence formerly. No one ever talked about faith. No one ever talked about forgiveness. They were afraid. If we talk about faith and forgiveness, people won't do good works. But they're not doing good works. They're doing outwardly good things, which we talked about last time, are actually worthless things because it's just stupid stuff. Like saying Hail Marys and saying Our Fathers over and over again, babbling without really meaning it. I mean, shouldn't the satisfaction that's pronounced benefit people somehow? Go wash the church windows or something. It'd be somewhat useful, I suppose. But... <clears throat> Hey, number 8, read Article 12, paragraphs 7 and 8. And first of all, cite a biblical example of a believer who lost the Holy Spirit and his faith. Judas Iscariot? Judas would probably be the most obvious example. Um, we're told he was a disciple. Um, if it isn't spelled out clearly that Judas had faith, he's lumped together with all the disciples who do put their faith in Jesus. But Judas lost his faith. Um, King Saul King Saul was a believer. He had fruits of faith in, in, in his life. He confessed God and offered God sacrifices that God accepted. And then he lost his faith, and God would not accept his sacrifices anymore. Pharaoh, because he kind of kept going back and forth and then 
finally God just hardened his heart for him? Yeah, I don't no, no I don't know that we'd ever classify him as a believer. Even in, in even when he acknowledges God, like we talked about last time, you can acknowledge God and not believe in him. Right. But but Pharaoh is a really good example of God hardening someone's heart after they have chosen to harden their own hearts. And God does the same thing with Saul. God hardens Saul's heart after Saul has decided to harden his heart. <clears throat> so, How about Cain? Cain, sure. How could Cain not have been a believer originally? Yeah. And sure, he certainly acknowledged God, was willing to talk to God, but don't know how he died, but um, as he commits the sin of murder and complains to God that his punishment is too harsh, uh, he's certainly not acting in faith. Okay, then table three, first John one verse eight, please. If we claim to be without sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay. Can people ever reach a state of perfection in this life? No. So the Anabaptists preached that sanctification, that ongoing sanctification, which would eventually result in perfection. You know, keep, keep, on, keep on keeping on and you'll eventually be perfect, they taught. And then, if once a person is saved, they're always saved. They're sort of forerunners of strict Calvinists in that sense. Say, no, no you, you can lose your faith. Of course you can lose your faith. <clears throat> You have it, and it's yours, and if you want to throw it away, you can do that. I know some people that are, um, you know, <clears throat> against the Lutheran Church for that, that they, especially, like, say, if you had your child baptized, mm -hmm. and and now they fall, you know they're falling away. You know, it's like, you want them so bad to be back, so... But that's their own life. I mean, right. Well, I mean, and then, so what? Are, what do such churches then have to say about the people who've left their church? They have to say, well, they never really were saved to begin with. Then how do you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In essence, they're confessing the same truth; they just won't admit it. Okay, Article Twelve. Paragraph 9 about the novations. Um, and then we'll table 4, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 15, or 1 through 5, please. Uh, 1 Corinthians. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. I have already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as, I, just as I, if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed, and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Okay, so that's the enumeration of the sin. A man has his father's <laughs> wife. Uh, and then the conclusion of that in 2 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8, table 5. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is significant for him. Now instead you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you therefore to reaffirm your love for him. Okay, so in his first epistle, Paul talks about this terrible sin that's going on, a father and his son sharing the same woman sexually, and now that that's been dealt with, in 2 Corinthians he says, okay, now deal with him according to love. Forgive him. He's repented. The punishment on that, that you've put on him in your ostracizing him has been sufficient. Bring him back in. So, I mean, what should we do when an errorist repents? Forgive them. Forgive them. This was a bit of a problem in the early church. Not only with the novations here, uh, as it says in paragraph 9, who would not absolve such as had fallen after baptism. In the early church, during the time of persecutions, 
there, came, there arose this practice that when a Christian under persecution denied Christ so that they could save the, the, themselves physically, they were not welcomed back into the church even after they repented. They're like, nope, persecution came, you didn't stand up under the persecution, you're not one of us anymore. No. <laughs> no, that's not right. <clears throat> Any sin repented of is forgiven by Jesus. And we dare not hold up certain sins as being too awful for someone to come back from. Now, there are some sins that have to be dealt with in certain ways, of course. If you have a convicted <clears throat> sex offender in the church, you do have to follow certain legal parameters and... You, you, you have to give people in the congregation, too, a, a certain level of assurance, too. No, we're not going to have this person working with children. No, we're, 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 we're not going to hide anything, but we're going to be above board. But yes, we're still going to welcome this person as a fellow Christian and understand that their sins are no worse than ours. What was the motivation for not... For not welcoming that person back in after they after they've been through the persecution. To highlight to the whole community that one should stand up under persecution. To, to, to say, hey, you know, we're in this together. We are going to whatever comes our way. We, we are going to be faithful to Christ. So I think their motives in setting up that system were, were to encourage each other. But they, they really fell down when it came to understanding God's grace. It sounds like a catch-22 for that person. Yes. Because yeah. on the one hand, you'll probably be burned mm -hmm. you know, or killed. And on the other hand, <coughs> if you renounce Christ, then you're basically put out of the church for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Right. Huh. Not a good thing. When an errorist repents, we welcome them back. Now... It's entirely possible that if a person has caused a great deal of damage in a, per, in a particular congregation, that it would be best if they joined a different Christian congregation. You would hope that perhaps they would have sense enough to recognize that. However, if that just can't happen or doesn't happen, it's still on every member then to understand that he's a, he or she is a forgiven sinner as I am a forgiven sinner. Does that look the same for a pastor who is asked not to be one anymore? For whatever they did, they repented. Could they then become a pastor again? Uh, probably not. Uh, there are different. There are different standards for for pastors and, and teachers and church leaders. And Paul outlines lines those in Titus. They have to be people above reproach. And now there have been, there have been men who have committed sins, uh, public sins, and then after a period of time it was felt they were rehabilitated to the point that they could resume their ministries. So you don't want to make any sort of blanket statement because every case is individual, but generally speaking, once someone has committed a public sin in the ministry and disgraced themselves in the congregation, it's best that they don't because the memory of what they did is going to linger a long, long time. So, and that isn't to question their eternal salvation. It's just saying, you know, as far as you being a leader of the church, if we had a treasure who embezzled $20,000, happened in a congregation I knew. Okay, if he repents, serves his jail time, comes back to church, fine. You think we're going to make him treasure again? No, probably not. <laughs> All right, just probably not a great idea. So. <laughs> well, you shouldn't put... The temptation in front of right. somebody. Right. I mean, that would be wrong of you to do. Right. I mean, of me to do. Yeah. To put that temptation out there when you know that if you had had a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes people don't always recognize that that would be an issue. So it's not fun when they have to be told, "No, you can't really do that anymore." And it isn't to say you're not forgiven. Now, that's one of the first things they'll bring up then. Like, aren't you, aren't I forgiven? Well, yes, you are forgiven. But 
it isn't in the best interest of the church that you resume this position. Okay, read Article 12, Paragraph 10. Who would this paragraph be directed against? That's, that's pretty obviously the Catholic Church. You merit salvation through satisfactions. And the key word really is that satisfactions because that's where the whole system of penance uh, hinges on the satisfaction that's pronounced by the priest. A good Catholic is always looking for satisfaction, looking to do satisfaction. But they can't do it on their own. They need a priest to tell them what satisfaction is. Now, in your average Catholic parish, how many people are actually good Catholics and believe that? I don't know. Hey, and finally, compare King Saul with King David and compare Peter with Judas. Who was repentant and who wasn't and why? King David was repentant. How do we know? Well, after Nathan told him, you know, after that, mm -hmm. he repented. Yep. And then he wrote Psalm 51, Cleanse me, wash <laughs> me, and I will be whiter than snow. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Uh, and then he talks in Psalm 32, he talks about how he felt before he <laughs> repented. He said, my bones were groaning all day long with the guilt of this sin on me. And it wasn't any small sin. Adultery, murder, pretty big sins. King Saul. King Saul just never repented. And there isn't even one huge sin we can point to and say, Oh, Saul, you need to repent of that sin. It's just this progression of thinking he can do things his own way. When God says, I want that king, that, <clears throat> that heathen king who's been making mischief among my people, I want him put to death. And King Saul lets him live. And God says, I want those flocks destroyed, and those, the, I want that, those cattle destroyed. And Saul says, I can make some use of those. It just makes things, and then when Samuel confronts him, when God's prophet <coughs> confronts him, Saul says, well, hey, I mean, I could sacrifice some of this to the <coughs> Lord. That would be good, right? Just making stuff up his own way. When confronted, one king is repentant and one king is not. You think about the way he died, too, mm -hmm. the way that Saul died. He killed himself, right? Yeah. But he didn't have his servant run, run him through? He ordered his servant to. The servant refused. So he did it himself, and then the servant killed himself. So Saul's godlessness had rubbed off on those around him as well. Um, <coughs> so who gets the credit for King David being repentant and King Saul not? Can we say David's a better person than Saul? It's God who works repentance in David's heart. In those nine months to a year, between the time that David committed the sin and David confessed his sin, David is in a very dangerous place spiritually. And it's only by God's grace that he's brought out of that. God demonstrated the same grace to Saul. Saul did reject it by sending Samuel again and again. Did David realize it... <coughs> Or was that Nathan came and said, told him uh, what he did? Well, yes and no. Um, I think he thought he'd gotten away with it, but he, I, like he confessed in Psalm 32, he says inwardly he's wasting away because of the guilt of this sin. Of course, he knows it's wrong, but he figures, oh, there are a lot of things that kings have to do, and this is just one of them. And, 
and he thinks he's all right until David tells or Nathan tells the little story and then says, "You are the man." I'm like, oh, yeah, I am. And then immediately doesn't take doesn't take Nathan five seconds before he says, "The Lord has taken away your sin." So he took away a sin, but then there's the but boy the child died. died. The child died. Okay, and compare then Peter and Judas. Well, Jesus looked at him and he knew that he sinned, you know, denied Christ. <laughs> mm -hmm. Both of them are confronted with their sin by Jesus himself. And then uh, Peter, you know, went away and wept. Mm -hmm. and Judas uh, went away too. He, he felt terribly, terribly guilty threw the coins in the temple, went out and hanged himself. So, the guilt was there on both sides. Peter and Judas both felt guilty. But eventually, Peter turned to the Lord for forgiveness and for comfort. And Judas thought there was none. Like, he knew who Jesus was. Like, I betrayed him. I can't be forgiven. Even after all he's been, the three years that he's been with him. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the power of Satan. When Satan tells a lie, he can get people to believe that lie. And those without the Lord will believe nearly anything as long as they don't have to believe him. It isn't that Judas's sin is worse than Peter's. It isn't that Saul committed worse sins than King David. It's just... In each case, one looked to God for forgiveness and received it, and one couldn't find forgiveness and committed suicide. Okay, anything else on confession, repentance? <clears throat> Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the old liturgy, we would confess our sins to you and we would call ourselves poor, miserable sinners. And truly, that, that is what we are. Uh, we know that our sins offend you and disgust you, which just highlights how great your love is for us, that you would allow us to come into your presence and still be called your children. So for the sake of your great love, we ask you when our consciences are bothering us to drive us to you, to remember the sacrifice your Son, our Lord, made for us, and to send the Spirit into our hearts that we truly try to live lives that please you. And when we stumble and fall, pick us up again with your gospel and point us to the heavenly home which Jesus has won for us. In his name we pray. Amen.